There are various ways to access your GridDB server. In this chapter, we will walk through using each of these different methods, starting first with the TQL and API interface. TQL is a SQL-like GridDB query language. Using the two query languages is very similar, though there are obviously some distinct differences. For example, when using TQL and you are running a query, the query string does not need a table or container specified. This is because queries are run only after a container has already been selected. Another differentiating feature of TQL is that they can use special time series functions. And also, it is a more performant option between the two options. And though TQL does support conditional operators, it does not give developers access to query commands which support data manipulation, data management, or transaction processing. This means that the following SQL commands are not used. Group by, having, distinct, etc. So although TQL and SQL are both valid GridDB query strings, the main reason you'd use TQL over SQL is for using the time series functions and for the performance boost. Here are some simple examples of what a TQL query string may look like. I'm sure you can see the resemblance to SQL. GridDB allows for interfacing with various programming languages, including Java and Python, which are the two most popular language program connectors. What the API does is allow for connecting to and using your GridDB server. Once your credentials have been entered and your master variable set, you can use straightforward API calls like query or put to interact with the database. All of the programming languages generally interface with GridDB in the same manner, except for Java. So first, we will take a look at some Python code. This connector looks and behaves similarly to all the other non-Java connectors, so it can be a good bellwether for how your programming interactions will look and feel like. So let's walk through a simple Python script which connects to and queries a GridDB instance. All right, and so what we're looking at here is a simple Python sample program. So within this program, we will showcase a few of the things that is possible with your GridDB instance. So first is um, just the general imports. So this is generally how it's done. Um, and then from there, we enter in our GridDB credentials, which is this step here. So we declare the valuable uh, store, which is the grid store object. And within that, we need to um, declare some credentials here. So these are just the default. So if you um, install a fresh GridDB instance and are following along, um, this should also be accurate for you, um, except for the cluster name. But this is the cluster name that is set in all GridDB documentation. <clears throat> all right, so if you wanted to, let's say, create a time series container, you would first create the schema by setting this variable called coninfo. Um, in this case, we're naming it blog. Um, and you can see here, we're declaring it as a time series container. So if you remember, the time series container means that the row key is a timestamp. So the first um, type that we're declaring here in this schema is a timestamp. And the other stuff is just generic um, IoT type related data. So once you declare that as your schema, you um, you use the store variable to put the container. You can see here, so the TS variable now is this container. So if you wanted to put data into that container, you can see here you use the API called put. So TS put, and you just put in values you want. So here's a timestamp. We put in active true and voltage and none so for now. And none means null value. Um, and then you can put again here. So now we're updating the time with this. And then if you wanted to query from um, this container that we've created called blog, um, you would create the query like so. So ts.query, um, you select whatever you want here. So in this case, we're doing a, um, we're creating a normal, a normal query for a range of timestamp from X hours ago to now. Um, so that's what that query looks like. And um, to execute, you would just do query.fetch. Um, and then the results get stored into this RS variable. And so RS, um, you have to do a loop. So you do a while loop to iterate through 
the results of this row set, RS. And um, if you run this, it'll print out the values that we input here earlier. Um, so yeah, I hope this kind of shows you a very simple overview of how it looks when you use Python to connect to your GridDB instance. Java Database Connectivity, or JDBC, is a simple way to access your database using SQL with the native Java programming language interface. With the other programming language connectors, you can still run SQL commands using the query API call. But with the Java connector and JDBC, you can use full SQL commands, including the data definition language, to create databases, tables, etc. The GridDB Web API allows for interaction with the GridDB server through HTTP requests. Through the requests, you can create containers, append rows to existing containers. You can even run the full suite of TQL and SQL commands. Another nice thing about the Web API is that the use of HTTP requests opens the door for using third-party apps with your database. And indeed, apps such as Grafana and Telegraph are usable with this connector. Down here you can see an example of a HTTP request you might make to the same server hosting your database. All right, so in this one we're gonna showcase using the GridDB Web API. Um, so we're just gonna go through the simple examples that are on the GitHub page. Um, so you can see here I've already got the GridDB Web API running on another terminal, so it's ready to go. So first, um, let's try to create a container. Um, so the command to do that is the one you see here. So um, it's a post request. Um, I have my uh, username and password here. Um, you have to add the content type, which is a JSON file. And then you have the container names. In this case, it's just video. Container type is going to be collection. And um, you have the schema here. So there's going to be three columns, column one, column two, and column three. And you can see that column one is a string type, column two is an integer type, and column three is a Boolean. Um, and then you just um, do the appropriate web URL. So in this case, it's same server with the port 2727. Uh, yep, so you launch this. No error code, so that's good. Um, so then next, we're going to want to put data into there. So I have these saved here. Um, and then paste that in there. So in this case, we're going to put in one row um, with the, the values are here. So value one and true. So this lines up with the types we made earlier. Um, and you can see here in the URL, we changed uh, it to have the container name, which is video. Press enter. And you can see here we get confirmation count one. So now there's one row in that container. And then we can paste this last query here. Um, so this one is we're just going to query all rows from this container. So actually we have a limit of 1000. Uh, but right now we know there's only one row. So no danger there. You can see here again, the container name is in the URL. We enter this and you can see the schema here. And then you can see the row here, value one true. Okay. And um, just to show one more thing, I have one more, I have a slightly bigger data set. It's um, a serial data set. So um, I have here the um, command already set. So um, I'm querying the container serial, all caps. It's a post request. And um, so here I have a different kind of authorization. I have um, the my admin username and password encoded. And I also have the limit 1000. So if I enter this and there's all of my data so obviously it's ugly in the terminal but if you have some kind of application which can parse and read this data you can make it look nice